In book six, we see one of the most well-known parts of Virgil's Aeneid, the trip to the underworld. Uh, we have, of course, seen such a thing in the Odyssey before, but Virgil's is quite a bit different. Uh, one thing we can uh, observe to start off with is that Virgil's underworld has a different kind of function than it did in Homer's epic. Uh, recall in Homer's time that when Homer talks about Odysseus go to, going down to the underworld, Odysseus goes down there, he's trying to find some knowledge about what uh, he did wrong and how he might right the wrong that is causing him all this suffering. He's trying to find Tiresias and get some information from him about what's, uh, what needs to get fixed. Um, in going down there, it's pretty clear that this underworld is a giant sort of holding cell. It's just a place where dead uh, uh, spirits go, and all of them would rather be alive. Uh, not that much happens down there. There's a few famous sinners that are being punished for eternity, but mostly everyone is in the same boat. They're all just gray, and they all wish they were alive. It's not as though there are good ones over there getting treated well, and there are ones that aren't so good over there getting punished. Uh, that doesn't really happen in uh, Homer's underworld. Again, except for those few very famous sinners who've done awful things to the gods. They have punishments. But they're, they're outliers. Now, when we get to Virgil's underworld, things are quite different. It is very carefully constructed by Virgil as a place where ethical scores are settled. Those that have done well in life get beautiful afterlives, and they have nice long periods of uh, uh, joyful and happy things that surround their uh, eternity. For those that have had evil, that have been evil in their lives, they have awful afterlives, and they're actually physically punished. Now, this is a very different kind of world uh, that we see uh, happening in Virgil, and quite a different, quite a contrast from what happens in Homer. Uh, there are intervening traditions that Virgil is working off of uh, that are helping him build this notion of what the afterlife is about based on precedents that uh, exist in Roman theological uh, uh, ideas, Roman ideas about the gods, uh, and also going back to some currents in Greek materials, especially in Pythagorean philosophy. And an example of this uh, approach to the underworld actually shows up in Plato's Republic in Book 10, way back in classical Athens. It's not at all a normal belief at the time Plato's talking about it, uh, but after Virgil makes the underworld look like this, it becomes very normal uh, in the West. And as it's adopted into Christian theology, uh, this idea of the afterlife as a place where ethical scores are settled uh, is very much uh, a regnant uh, idea. Uh, but we're getting to see it here, really, uh, in, in its most uh, powerful mythical form in uh, Virgil's Aeneid in Book 6. Uh, Virgil gets very specific about what happens. The uh, details here are spelled out in a way that, you know, Virgil's bring his rationalizing brain to bear on this question of the underworld. In Homer, it was pretty foggy. Odysseus went far away. He landed, and, and, and the spirits came out of a cave to come talk to him. Uh, Virgil, we see a full architecture of things and uh, a, a way that everything works. Now, the afterlife is a, uh, the underworld is a tricky place, as we know. It's easy to go down, but very hard to come back. Uh, we hear this in lines 185 to 90 in our translation uh, that we're using for this class. Uh, it's, of course, easy to find your way to the underworld. Death is too close to any of us, uh, and sadly close to all of us. Uh, we're fragile creatures, uh, so it's easy to get down there. But coming back, that's the tricky part. So Aeneas is going to have to try to figure out a way to disrupt the regular order of things, make his way there, but then somehow also come back. The Sibyl tells him that there's going to be a way for him to do this. He's going to have to find a spe very special piece of foliage. Uh, there is a thing called the Golden Bough, and made famous in mythology, wonderfully uh, resonant poetic image in Virgil, uh, made famous in contemporary circles uh, when uh, James Joy George Frazier decided to name a seminal work in the study of mythology in the early 1900s. He decided to name it the Golden Bow after this, and from then it became, uh, I think, uh, really uh, firmly established in uh, at least contemporary study of mythology, this image. So let's take a look at what happens. Uh, recall that when uh, the Sibyl announces it to Virgil, she tells him that he'll have to go and find this bow. Uh, the bow is there, and Sibyl tells him that it will come willingly and easily if you are called by fate, uh, page 215. Uh, sorry, line 215, she says. But the, uh, uh, and, and she further says that if you're not called by fate, there's no way you could rip it off no matter how strongly you pull. 
So it's either going to come off willingly and easily, or there's no way you would be able to pull it off. Okay? So if you're fated to go, it will basically fall off in your hands. And if you're not fated to go, there's no way you'll be able to get the thing off. Take a look at what happens, though, looking on page 167 in our translation. Uh, it's lines 295 and following. What really happens when Aeneas goes there? Uh, the lines are, as written up here on our screen, so bright amid the dark leaves, green ilex shone, the golden leafage rustling in light wind. Aeneas at once briskly took hold of it, and though it clung, greedily broke it off, then carried it to the Sibyl's cave. Now, it's not entirely clear here what happens, but Virgil spells out what seems to be a pretty clear middle way between the two distinctive and mutually exclusive possibilities that the Sybil gave us. Either it will fall off in your hand if you're fated, or no matter how hard you pull, you'll never be able to get it off. Well, it doesn't fall off in Aeneas' hand, and he's not foiled in his attempt to yank the thing off. He briskly takes hold of it, and though it clung, he greedily broke it off and carried it back to the Sybil's cave. So we're given here a possibility that the Sybil seems to rule out, and it's a classic moment of Virgil taking a circumstance that he's already set up and given us very clear possibilities, and then he finds a middle way through to say, actually, something else kind of happened. He doesn't then come back and explain it to us and say, oh, by this I meant to say, but he leaves it in there as a point of incongruity in the story. Uh, this uh, way of leaving uh, shadows in his text, uh, blank spaces, spots that don't seem like they make sense according to the parameters that he himself set up. We saw this in the case of the marriage and uh, Dido and Aeneas in the cave. It's tricky to figure out what happened there. Uh, and in the case of the Golden Bough, it's tricky as well. Was, Virgil, uh, was Aeneas supposed to pull that bow off? Was he fated to be there? Well we don't really hear that he was because it doesn't fall off in his hand, but we also don't hear that he wasn't fated to be there because he is able to yank it off. And uh, Virgil says that if he weren't fated to be there, he would never have been able to get it off. So from that, with that uh, detail not resolved, uh, we head off and head down to the underworld. Uh, there are invocation of underworld gods that Virgil gives us as we move down, descending into the, uh, into the cave. We hear about Hecate and Night and Earth and Proserpina, who is our Roman name for Persephone. This world is definitely down below. We're moving down with Aeneas and the Sibyl. Virgil shows us an architecture uh, that is very elaborate and detailed and has a strong downward trajectory. Sadness and death are personified around us. We see these scary things that are happening, but Virgil reassures us, line 400 in our translation, that these are empty monsters, so we shouldn't really be scared of them. Uh, we're down in the underworld where there is no substance to things, so there can't be substance that could physically harm you uh, in the form of these nasty things floating around. They're just shades. Um, this is Virgil as a rationalizing uh, scientific kind of mind uh, looking at this fantasy of what the underworld's all about. Uh, we then, on our way to the point where we're going to cross over the River Styx and move into Limbo and the uh, other stages of the underworld, on our way there we run into a figure, don't we? This man, Palinurus. Uh, we saw him mentioned at the end of our last book. Uh, he's, remember, a hand on the tiller guiding the ship away, and he turns out to die but we don't know it. Um, so we run into him in that way, very much parallel to how the role that Elpinor played in the Odyssey. Remember him? Uh, we had in Homer's telling of the tale, Elpinor died unbeknownst to us. We go down to the underworld, we meet Elpinor. Hey, what are you doing here? Elpinor tells us, hey, come on, bury me. The dead want to be buried. And then after the underworld, we come out and we meet and bury Elpinor. Well, it works a little bit like this, but Palinurus is not fulfilling the full story here. We also have Palinurus and Mycenaeus together. Palinurus comes up and tells us, I'm dead, you didn't know it, and I want to be buried, uh, we learn from, uh, from uh, the Sybil that he's going to be buried by the locals uh, where he died, so we're not going to bury him at the end of our stage, uh, but uh, we do need to, to carry on, so we're just going to move forward. And in the meantime, we meet up with Mycenaeus, who is someone who's already dead, uh, who's been buried, and we're going to see him on the other side. So uh, in a typical Virgilian spin, he takes one character of Elpinor and splits him into two. Both Mycenaeus and Palinurus play different parts of Elpinor's role for us. 
Uh, we then, through the Sybil's uh, encouragement and nudging and showing off the golden bow, we get ourselves across the river Styx on Charon's boat. But notice what happens when Virgil, an embodied human being, hops onto a boat that's meant to carry shades. The boat is creaking under the weight. Uh, again, this is Virgil as a rationalizer, trying to figure out what would it be like if some embodied human being went down to the underworld. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of what great science fiction writers and contemporary genres do today. Uh, they take the laws of physics such as they know them and then try to insert them into worlds of extreme uh, uh, bending of those laws, but they hold on to the ones they can in this world of bent laws. Well, that's happening here uh, with Virgil too, as the Charon's boat is creaky. Uh, they then get across uh, the river, lines uh, 560 and following in our translation. We meet this dog, Cerberus, who guards the underworld, toss him a cake that keeps him quiet and lets us get across. Uh, at that point, we enter into the realm of limbo. We see in limbo the untimely dead. Uh, these are figures like infants, those who've been unjustly condemned, suicides, those who died for love. And wouldn't you know it, we meet up with Dido there. It's a sad place, uh, not a good place to be. Uh, and it's a spot that's reserved for people who have not necessarily done wrong things. It's just that they've died in a way that, that uh, their circumstance uh, did not allow them to experience the full pleasure uh, that's possible in an afterlife. And we're going to see what that is. That's waiting for us when we round the corner. Uh, we see our judges operating down there. Minos is making judgments on souls and sending them one direction or another. Uh, and as we make our way down, we see uh, a whole mix of people who are mixed up in nasty stuff. And eventually we get down to Tartarus. And there, here's where all the very worst sinners are. Aeneas is curious. He wants to go see this. Uh, the Sybil says, no, uh, you can't go down there. It's too nasty. Uh, Radamanthus acts as judge down there. And awful things get dealt with in awful ways. And she then instead describes it. At this point then, she says, we've got to get on our way. And we hear a description from Virgil on page 178 that dawn crosses the meridian. Dawn is crossing the meridian. Here we are at the bottom of our underworld. And if dawn is crossing the meridian, what does that exactly mean? Uh, we're, we're in the underworld. How, how is it that dawn could be crossing past us? And then she goes on to describe night arrives Aeneas. Well, if dawn is crossing the meridian, how is it that night is arriving? Well, it could be that what Virgil's talking about here is, an, is the topsy-turvy world that we're in. If dawn is crossing the meridian up in the upper spheres, then it could be that night is arriving in the lower spheres. And since we're down below, we're seeing night arrive as dawn is crossing the upper meridian. But it's really hard to tell. Uh, we're stuck down here with Bruegel in the underworld. Uh, ugh. Uh, that's a wonderful representation. You uh, wouldn't have wanted to live inside of this man's mind. Uh, but uh, one of the most famous representations of Virgil's underworld says we have it from Bruegel. Uh, you wouldn't want to spend a lot of time down here. And uh, Sybil is anxious and ready to move on, saying to Aeneas, come on, let's get going. The world is topsy-turvy. It's really hard to peg exactly where we are. But I think that uh, uh, Virgil is giving us some clues with dawn across the meridian and night arriving. Uh, at that point, we move away, thank goodness, from these nasty bits that we see of uh, people being punished all over the place. And we start to move into a different kind of world. It's brighter and it's lighter. Uh, the figure that we see first is Aeneas, uh, Anchises, Aeneas' father. And he's going to introduce us to what's happening over here. And at the same time, give us an explanation, uh, some larger explanation of a lot of the things that we've been seeing already uh, so far in the underworld.